Sometimes there's paleontology discussions that can just drive you insane. And a lot of that is because a lot of the papers that get published are then talked about in different kinds of pop science articles. And then those articles are taken at face value by the public. One such case is with the recent paper looking at the potential number of neurons in very large theropod dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex. And that's also caused a lot of people to make memes about it. So what does the paper itself actually make as its arguments? Because there's plenty of articles about how, oh look, T-Rex was as smart as a baboon, could have used tools and could have built a society, which, I don't know, I don't see no Tyrannosaurus Rex shaped pyramids out there. So the first thing these authors did is they took a lot of animals that were related to the dinosaurs. And this includes many modern groups, such as some crocodilians, but also turtles and also lizards, but also importantly, birds, which themselves are dinosaurs. Now this kind of practice of using data that was collected from another study is pretty regular. I mean, it's still good data. You can apply it to other studies at the same time. So there's nothing outrageous or wild going on there. However, what they did do with this is then try to compare it and scale it up into dinosaurs and essentially try and look at whether or not those animals were warm or cold blooded and how big their brains were relative to their body size. And this essentially splits the dinosaurs into two separate groups of cold blooded dinosaurs and warm blooded dinosaurs. And this is because in general, cold blooded animals will have a slightly smaller brain size relative to the entire body. And so based on this, they were able to say, yeah, some of the dinosaurs would have been warm blooded and some of them would have been cold blooded. But importantly for us, we're mainly talking about Tyrannosaurus rex because that's where the headlines came from. And from the data, they assume that Tyrannosaurus would have been in that warm blooded group. And from that, they assume it would have had a bird like brain. And from that, they assume that it would have had potentially the same number of neurons as a baboon, from which they assume that it was probably about as intelligent as a baboon, could have potentially used tools and, you know, maybe even make a society of some degree. I mean, even some modern day crows have arguably societies just because of their social structures. So it's, it's a very specific term, but I don't think necessarily people are actually thinking they went out and built things. Maybe use some tools, but not building things. Now, I'm sure what you heard during most of that was the word assumption or assumed. And the thing is, assumptions aren't necessarily bad. In fact, the author of this paper has done a lot of really great work with more modern brain evolution. So like, she, she's good at what she does. She, she's had really influential papers. It's just when you're looking further back in the fossil record, there's a different set of assumptions and different sets of data that you need to look at. And that's something that's just not fully understood by everyone because she's not a paleontologist, she's a neurologist. And paleontologists probably wouldn't be able to just jump straight into brain science either. There's different types of thinking that you need for different sciences. You need to look at different tracks of different data and especially with paleontology, you need to look at what's available. You can make assumptions in modern science and then test those assumptions. A lot of the assumptions that are made in this paper, you can't really test very effectively. And one of the best cases of this from this paper is actually just looking at the error. There's somewhere between 446 million neurons in Tyrannosaurus brain to all the way up to 3.3 billion with a B neurons. So there's this massive gap, essentially this massive margin of error that could be on either side of this. Meaning that there's, again, not really a good way to test specifically how many neurons it would have had. There's a lot of error there, and so making assumptions based on that data is a little iffy for paleontology. The author also makes specific mention that the birds they chose were from clades of which the clades had already split before the KPG impact, essentially the big rock that came from the sky and killed off the non-avian dinosaurs. Those birds that were chosen had already evolved, or at least their groups had started to evolve before that impact. So you're not getting this kind of after effect of the later diversification of birds potentially affecting the study. And that's really great, except when you're considering that, that's 66 million years ago. And at 66 million years ago, things like the lineage that led to the chickens and Tyrannosaurus rex had already been separated from one another by over 100 million years. So even if you're trying to keep track and manage that single extinction event to try and make sure you're holding as much of the original data as might have been there, there's still a hundred million years of data that you're not accounting for, simply because evolution takes a long time sometimes, and in this case, there's a long time between these two groups. The brains could have very easily changed, and in fact, based on the shape, that is also what we see. This paper doesn't really make a big deal about the shape of the brain, instead it's more focused on just the volume of the brain. And that's something really important to consider because the fact is Tyrannosaurus rex didn't have a bird brain. Its brain was not shaped like a bird, instead it was shaped more like a crocodilian. 
And the thing is, from what we found about some early birds and their brain cases, like an ichthyornis, it looks like that may have gave them better dexterity with their beaks, and may have been part of the reason they were so successful and actually survived that extinction. So we can't just slap a bird brain straight onto a Tyrannosaurus rex and call it good. We need to do a little bit more than that and consider that maybe it was a more crocodilian-like brain, even if it was warm-blooded. Additionally, the math that was done is pretty much just scaling up a bird brain and putting those number of neurons at that neuron density into a Tyrannosaurus rex skull. And the thing is, skulls and brains don't necessarily scale perfectly. I mean, even elephants have more neurons than humans do, but it's not a perfect scale for their mass and the size of their brain. And also, humans, I would still argue, are smarter than elephants, even if elephants aren't destroying the planet. And that's really down to the number of synapses that are occurring on those neurons, essentially how many connections are there between neurons. If each neuron in a brain only connects to one other neuron, you're not going to get as much thought coming from the organism. And I do want to be fair here. This isn't to say that it's bad or wrong, just that this author probably should have brought in some paleontologists, especially paleoneurologists, who do some of the stuff more similar to this kind of paper. I mean, they look at brain cases and try to understand what the animal would have been able to do just cognitively. And the thing is, there's still a good chance Tyrannosaurus rex may have used tools, at least to some degree. In fact, there's been papers showing that even crocodilians do use tools. Specifically in some alligators, they'll actually collect sticks and hide under them only during the times of year that some shorebirds are actually nesting. And so essentially they're using those sticks as baits for those birds that are going to use those sticks to try and build a nest. So it's using bait, that's arguably a tool. Alligators use tools. There's no reason to say Tyrannosaurus rex couldn't use tools, it's just you'd need some really hard evidence to try and prove that idea. And it'd be also really hard to try and think of an idea that they might have been using tools for. And so this is just a great example of one of those paleo topics that is frustrating because it's someone who's not a paleontologist but is a very much an expert in their field coming into paleontology without the full understanding of the history of the science. Essentially, what's been done for paleontology before involving brains and what the current plans are to study in the future. And it's really highlighting a case of where, yeah, paleontology more than arguably any other science just really needs a lot of cross-disciplinary work. It'd be great if she worked with other paleontologists on this, but it'd also be great if paleontologists brought in people like that to help work on some of these neurology problems. There's a lot of diversity in paleontology as far as what we're studying. There could be other diversity that needs help, but still, what we're studying, it's a broad swath of very different topics. And so hopefully we can try and use this example to try and understand that we do need more people in this field because there's a lot going on.